Welcome to U of Today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is poet Juliana Gray, professor of English at Alfred University in Western New York. Gray is the author of three poetry collections, The Man Under My Skin, Role Play, and Honeymoon Palsy. Her poems have appeared in numerous anthologies and journals. Her humor writing has been published at McSweeney's Internet Tendency, The Belladonna, The Millions, and elsewhere. On October 14th, 2020, Gray will give a virtual reading as a guest of the University of Oregon's Creative Writing Program. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you. So could you tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, I grew up in Alabama uh, and my, my father was a high school teacher. He taught primarily history, but he had also trained in English and um, he, um, forced a love of reading upon me at an early age and it, it's, it stuck. He always loved poetry, he loved writing. Um, so he made me love it too. So I've, I've been writing since I, was, um, since I was a little kid, mostly thanks to his influence. Would you be willing to read us a poem? Oh, absolutely. Uh, let's see. I, I think I'll read uh, the title poem from uh, my most recent collection, Honeymoon Palsy and uh, it's, um, the title comes from, uh, it's an actual medical condition, honeymoon palsy, which is described in the poem, but basically it's what happens when, um, when lovers are in bed together spooning and um, the circulation is cut off on one person's arm because they've got their arm underneath their lover's head or shoulders um, and the arm goes numb, that's called honeymoon palsy. Um, in researching that, I found out that there were other palsies like Friday night palsy, if you, get so wasted that you pass out in your armchair and then the circulation gets cut off oh. by the arms. That's Friday night palsy. It's a whole range of these, um, but I, I stuck with just the one. So um, this is honey, honeymoon palsy. After fumblings they call making love, the newlywed couple spoons, a pose they've seen in movies, hand on breast, his nose buried in her hair, his arm shoved beneath her head. The tender weight above his arm seems nothing, so he sleeps, enclosed in bliss, the afterglow's sweet repose. He wakes to a hand dead as a pitcher's glove. Usually, the damaged nerve recovers. Throughout the long, oblivious nights, they lie seemingly aligned, heart to heart. Already, they've learned so much, these new lovers touching without meeting the other's eye, going numb to each other, part by part. That's a wonderful poem. Thanks so much for reading it. Oh, thank uh, you. Since you've, you've begun by reading a poem from Honeymoon Palsy, I want to ask you a little bit about the volume overall. Um, there are quite a number of uh, poems in the volume that are concerned with death, and some of them are quite macabre. There's mm -hmm. a number of poems about Lizzie Borden. Uh, there's a poem about uh, one of America's first serial killers. Um, tell us a little bit about why you're interested or attracted to poems about death and also the kind of role that macabre humor plays in your poem. Mm -hmm. um. I think those are those are probably related questions, but not exactly the same question. Uh, one of the one of the subjects of, of that book, Honeymoon Palsy, um, particularly the poems in the middle section, um, have to do with the death of my father, who I mentioned earlier, um, who I was very close with, and he died um, he died very suddenly, uh, and um, I was sort of working out how to think about that. Um, through some of the poems. So the, the middle section has to do with, with that death in particular, that loss. Um, but I've, I've always been um, uh, sort of interested in, in subjects that were a little darker, a big Stephen King fan as a, as a kid. Um, and nowadays I, I'm very interested in true crime. Um, I, I listen to and watch and read a lot of documentaries and books about true crime. I'm, I'm interested in, um, in what people are capable of, I think, um, and sort of trying to understand um, why they do what they do um, to each other. 
Um, so yeah, Lizzie Borden is, is one that I'm interested in. I, I would happily go off on a whole separate lecture about that case and how I don't think she did it, but I won't do that here. Um, and, uh, and some of the other historical cases in particular, I like history as well. Um, so just thinking about how those figures fit into the world that they lived in and how they relate to us today is, um, is very compelling to me. Uh, and yeah, the sense of humor, I think is just, that's just my personality. Um, it may not always make other people laugh, but I amuse myself. So I just wanted to show our readers the, the yeah. cover image by Sandra Yagi. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, chosen for the cover. Yeah. I mean, how cool is that? Look at those dancing skeletons. So tell yeah. us a little bit about how you understand that image and why you, you thought it was appropriate to be on the cover of this book. Yeah. Um, I, I know of that artist because she did the cover of, uh, of another poetry collection by Nikki Beer. Uh, and that image, um, it's a fantastic cover. I think the, the title of the book is The Octopus Game. And the image by Sandra Yagi, that same artist that she used on the cover, was of a skull that was open at the crown and it had an octopus inside and the octopus is kind of emerging, um, you know, uh, like, like ideas or, or something like that. It was a beautiful image. So I went to the author's website and I started looking at her, her work and I really fell in love um, with that image of the, of the skeletons who are, um, who are conjoined, right? If you can see that, um, but dancing together. And, um, and I was already thinking about marriage um, and uh, my, my father, who I mentioned, um, he died the morning after his wedding. Uh, he, he got married and then the next morning he didn't wake up, um, most likely from sleep apnea, although hmm, we'll probably never really know. Um, so I was already thinking about the relationship between marriage and death. Uh, and I'm sort of approaching the subject of matter from another angle in, in some other poems. Uh, and then when I saw that cover image, I thought, nope, that's it. That's, that's the one I've got to, I've got to have it. It's, it's really an ideal image for the volume. It's such a, it's such a wild painting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, so you, you've just told us about the, um, the, the death of your father on his wedding night. And the second section of the volume is devoted to that topic. And also all of the titles in that section are quotations from Hamlet. And then there are right. all through that section of the po uh, of those poems to various lines or scenes in Hamlet. Will you say a little bit about why mm -hmm. Hamlet uh, struck you as appropriate for those poems? Right. Um, I, I was thinking, um, I think, first and, and most obviously about, um, about that conjunction of, of a, a marriage and a funeral. Um, in Hamlet, it's the opposite, right? The, the, king, the king Hamlet dies and then um, his brother marries Queen Gertrude. So the, the funeral is followed by a wedding. Um, in, in the case of, of my father and our family, it was, the, it was the opposite. It was the wedding followed by the funeral, um, but still um, one coming really hard off the heels of the other and uh, you know, I'm an English professor. I can't help it. These these connections occur to us. So so in the I think the day after um, my father died, as I was in my brand new stepmother's house, literally eating leftovers from the wedding dinner, um, the the lines of, of Horatio's from from Hamlet um, occurred to me, and Hamlet saying thrift thrift um, about eating eating the leftovers from the funeral at the at the wedding um and it just started coming together I, I didn't really think of it as being a series of poems when i started writing them um but the more i got into it the more i thought yep okay this is something that i can work with to give to give these poems a little framework um to give them a structure so that it's not just it's not just me and my feelings that i can um sort of shore them up against literature um, and lean on that for support and for contrast for, for the differences as much as for the similarities. Um, and that, yeah, I think most of the time it worked pretty well. Oh, I think it worked very well all of the time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, you've you've, you've uh, brought up a couple of um, issues that are lead to my next question, which has to do with your interest in poetic form. In the mm -hmm. volume, there's a number of 
poems that are in fixed forms, in particular sonnets. But you've mm -hmm. just said a number of things about the structure and uh, and uh, the tradition that raise an interesting questions for me about what what are your how do you feel about form in poetry? Why is form something that's important for you in poetry? Um, it helps me uh, having form, having structure, whether that be just blank verse or or having you know loosely metered lines, or whether that be something more highly formal like a sonnet. Um, some people find that very restrictive. Um, they feel like they're being straight jacketed by form and that they, they don't have room to express themselves in, in the way that they want. Um, I, I find that really the opposite is true. I, I find those forms um, really liberating. I don't have to make any choices about how long that sonnet's going to be, right? It's going to be a sonnet. It's going to be 14 lines. It's going to be right around 140 syllables. So that frees me up to do something else inside the form and to um, push against it, maybe in some ways um, that um, might surprise me or, or allow me to do something unexpected. Um, but I, I, I think form, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person who likes crossword puzzles. You know, I like little, little word games like that. And to me, some of the forms sort of are satisfying in the same way that, um, that a game like a crossword puzzle is satisfying. Can I fit all these pieces together and make it cohere, make it, make it click um, into um, something cohesive? Would you be willing to read us another poem? Oh, sure. Let's see. Um, I wonder, maybe, I think maybe I will read um, a newer one. Uh, that's not in honeymoon palsy. So I'm, I'm now looking at a, um, a computer screen to get one of those. Uh, I was lucky enough uh, to have a, a residency at the Vermont Studio Center back in February, right before everything got shut down um, due to COVID. Uh, I think we were one of the last cohorts to go into, into VSC. Um, and I'm really, really grateful um, that I had that opportunity because I got a lot of writing done. Um, and was uh, able to, to get some new work um, put together. So one of the poems that I wrote there um, that I think is maybe coming back to, um, to your question about combining humor and the macabre or some subject matter that's a little darker um, is a poem called Blaming Mercury uh, that was published in a, on, on, sorry, an online journal called On the Seawall. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, you see people on social media or memes saying, oh, Mercury's in retrograde. That means, you know, fill in the blank, X horrible thing must be happening. Um, and I, I, I'm not a person who puts a lot of stock in astrology. Uh, so I was kind of, um, you know, gently and affectionately mocking that uh, a little bit. But then I think the poem goes a bit, um, a bit darker. Um, so this one's called Blaming Mercury. Mercury's in retrograde, they say, which means as much to me as stroganoffs in platypus. Yet friends assign this planet the blame for a raft of problems, clumsiness, acne, painful menstrual cycles, fights with family or partners, especially men. I've been lucky. The men I've dated never screamed or raised a hand, never tried to frighten me. The closest was a guy who turned loud and jealous when he drank. One night, tired of his shit, I drove away and he spit on my car. The next day he acted baffled, swore he'd never do that, till I was half convinced I hadn't seen what I saw. I ended things soon after. He beat my door, demanding that I talk to him, but left when I held a phone up to the window, dialed a nine, a one, Still, I wasn't afraid. I was lucky. My grandmother wasn't. Her husband sent flowers to win her back, then killed her. I know other women who've made the choice to flee the men they loved and blame themselves, their luck, their blood, a little ball of iron sulfide fleeing toward the sun. Sorry, I forgot that poem had profanity in it. Okay. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about, um, I mean, I know, I know from another interview that I saw with you that you're, mm -hmm. you're working on a project, 
uh, about uh, sexual abuse. Is this part of that project? This poem? It is. Um, I I was working on um, uh, poems about um, domestic violence and intimate partner violence uh, and and gun violence um, also, but particularly violence against women. Um, I I had read and was really just profoundly affected by the book No Visible Bruises by uh, Rachel Louise Snyder that is um, about intimate partner violence, especially in America, and it was. It's really just a, a stunning and um, disheartening book uh, about the rates of violence against women in particular um, committed by their partners. So I, I, I have been working on um, poems on that subject and that's primarily what I was working on at the time that I was at, uh, at Vermont Studio Center and, and wrote that poem, um, thinking about that subject and, and how, we, how we see it and, and don't talk about it. Um, and yet it's so common. Would you say a little bit, given what you've just said about your sense of, um, I mean, it, that's not a topic that many poets might write about. Mm -hmm. Say a little bit about your sense of what your, how you understand the kind of scope or responsibility of poetry is? Yeah. Um, the responsibility of poetry. Uh, I'm not sure there's just one. Uh, I think I think one thing the pandemic has shown us is is the value of art um, for one thing just as entertainment right as as people were locked down in their homes how how valuable it is to have access to literature to TV and movies to video games right graphic design visual arts um, for quality of life um, to give us something to enjoy or to think about. So sometimes when I'm writing, I just want to do something fun um, that more often takes the form of, of humor than of poetry, but sometimes a poem can be fun too. Um, but then I, I think you, you do want to, um, to have something to say to your reader um, that makes it worth their time to read the poem, right? So whether, whether the payoff for the reader is a laugh or um, it's raising a political issue or a social issue that makes them think uh, about um, their place in the world and, and how that issue also figures into to their lives or doesn't. Um, I think that's, that's one of the things that, that poetry can do. So you were born in Alabama, mm -hmm. and, uh, raised there as a child. Do you, yeah. do you consider yourself a Southern writer? And if you do, what does that mean to you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I lived in Alabama until I went to graduate school. So I would have been, I think, 22. And then I moved all the way to Tennessee. Huge shift. Uh, no, I've lived in the South um, most, of, most of my life, although I've lived here in Western New York for, uh, for 14 years. And um, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm definitely still still a southerner. Um, I don't go apple picking or kayaking. I don't know. I don't know what they're doing out there. Um, I'm not going to eat a grape pie. I don't. I'm not sure what they're what they're up to um, these Yankees. Um, but uh, but that said, I don't I don't go back to the south very much anymore. Um, I'm maybe a little more comfortable now observing it from a distance. Um, but yeah, that's absolutely, that's absolutely part of who I am. What does it mean to you to be a Southern writer? What, what is that? Yeah. How do you understand what that means? Um, part of it, I think, is just that connection to place and, and setting. You know, um, I, I love the maple trees. They're, they're great. But, uh, but when I think of, of home, I'm thinking of, of pines uh, and pin oak. Uh, I'm thinking of um, not having snow in October. As I look forward to that here in Western New York, um, but it also is complicated, right? The the history of of race relations in the South and um, and other historical issues. Yeah, you, you start to feel a little a little like Quentin Thompson saying, "I don't hate it. I don't hate it." Um, there are things I love about the South. There are things that I I regret about the South or wish were different, but. I mean, that said, even though I'm in the north, I'm in a, a very rural county, and I am as likely to see Confederate flags here 
as I would be in Alabama. Um, I think I saw one on Saturday as I was going for a walk. It was on a bumper sticker of a truck going by. So, you know, geography doesn't necessarily um, draw maybe the, the hard lines that we sometimes think it does. So you worked for many years at the Sewanee Writers Conference. Mm -hmm. Tell us what that is. Tell us a little bit about it and tell us why it's an important conference and why it was important for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Sewanee Writers Conference is a, a conference in Sewanee, Tennessee at, uh, at the University of the South, uh, which is between Nashville and Chattanooga in, in Tennessee. And um, I, was, I was very fortunate in graduate school to, um, to become friends with, um, with two of my former professors there, um, Andrew Hudgens and Aaron McGraw, who um, were really very, very good at um, encouraging me to do things that I wouldn't have done on my own, to apply for opportunities, to, um, to apply to conferences and publications and things like that. They, they pushed me. Uh, gently but firmly um, to do that. Um, so one of the things that they encouraged me to do was to attend the Suwannee Writers Conference, which I, I did attend um, as a scholar, just you know participating in the conference. And then I was fortunate, again, very fortunate enough to, to join the staff. Uh, so I worked on the staff of that conference for um, 13 summers. That's, that's, I don't know how many gallons of coffee I brewed in those, you know, great big industrial um, pots, um, a lot of airport runs, a lot of, a lot of wake up calls, um, a lot of introductions and fetching people extra towels and that kind of stuff. But it was wonderful um, to, to have that opportunity to be surrounded by, um, ooh, over a hundred writers and editors and literary agents and, and other people um, every summer for over a decade and to become friends with some of those folks and to hear so many incredible readings. I mean, Randall Keenan, the, the wonderful fiction writer who just recently passed away was on the faculty at Swanee for many years. So I got to hear him read and, and get to know him a little bit. Mark Strand, Claudia Emerson, um, just so many incredible writers. It was, um, it's probably, it's probably the, the the most wonderful thing that I've had the opportunity to, to do in my life. Would you be willing to read us another poem? Oh, sure. Let's see. Okay. Uh, I'll read one that is a little lighter than I did last time. Okay. Um, there was an anthology put out a few years ago um, called The Book of Scented Things. And it was poems about perfume. And the, the editors of that collection um, contacted some poets and said, would you be interested in doing this thing? And, um, and if you said yes, they sent you a tiny little vial of perfume, just this wee sample. And you didn't get to choose what it was. They just sent you one at random. And uh, they said, you know, okay, live with it, and walk around with it and, and see what you can write. So they sent me one um, that I'm, I'm not a, a wearer of perfume anyway, but what they sent me was not me. It was very, very sweet, um, just sugary smelling. I, I didn't care for it, um, but I did write a poem, uh, and the, uh, the title of the poem is also the title of the perfume, and it is French, and I took Latin, and I am not going to say it well, so apologies to French speakers who might be listening. Um, but the title is Vanille Abricot Comptoir Sud Pacifique. I've never been sweet, but two dabs behind the ear, and I'm a sugar cookie, a walking confection, light as a vanilla meringue. I strolled downtown, past a park where children abandoned slides tumbled like chimpanzees from the jungle gym, begging their mothers for candy. The ice cream parlors were mobbed for tutti frutti. The bakery sold out of snickerdoodles, shortbread, lady fingers, then barred their doors. I had a craving too, so stepped inside a hipster bar. The patrons' nostrils flared, they tossed their PBRs and ordered rounds of craft cocktails with muddled apricot, agave nectar, blood oranges, vermouth, and local cider. Their jaws ached for a taste of me. 
One skinny boy followed my trail through the town gone mad for sweetness back to my cottage in the woods. He told me his name as I peeled away his jeans, but I just called him Hansel. The skinny boys are all called Hansel and they fatten up just fine. There's that macabre sensibility again. <laughs> <laughs> See, I didn't know that, po that poem was funny when I wrote it. It was only when I read it to an audience and they laughed that I thought, oh, okay. I thought I was being spooky. Oh, well. <laughs> Well, that's, that's part of your signature, that combination of the spooky and the comic. Yeah. So you are also a writer of humorous uh, pieces. Uh, mm -hmm. some, some of them are poems, but very often they're in prose. Tell us uh, how you got to do that and how you yeah. see the relationship between your humor writing and your poetry. Um, yeah, I, uh, I had been reading um, some of the humor pieces on uh, on websites like McSweeney's Internet Tendency and, and some others for, for years and really, really enjoying them. Um, and then, you know, but I'm a poet, right? I'm a, I, so I do this thing uh, until one day sort of the light went off and said, no, no, this is just writing. I, I could do that. Let's give it a shot. Um, so I, I wrote a few attempts and submitted them and they got gently rejected and I wrote some more and submitted them and they got rejected and and then I, I, I got better at it uh, and so I, I started publishing a few of, of those pieces in um, in McSweeney's and the Belladonna and some other um, websites the internet is terrific for short form humor writing um, but I, I see them really as being pretty similar to poetry most of what I do anyway are monologues um, and I write a lot of uh, persona poems and in poetry. Um, so I think they start sort of in the same place, which is coming up with a character and, and thinking, okay, what does this person have to say? Um, is it going to be something that should be um, in blank verse and, you know, focus on imagery and, and maybe have something, something meaningful? Um, or is it going to be a little more smart, smart alecky um, or a satire or something like that? Uh, so yeah, I've, I've um, I really enjoyed writing those those humor pieces, and it's it's nice to know too that um, that people actually read them. That isn't something that poets always feel confident about. Um, so it's it's nice to think that there's an audience for for those pieces of writing. Well, they're entertaining for sure. You are very good at it. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> we're coming to the end of our time. Um, can you say a little bit about what you're working on now? Uh, I'm uh, still writing some of those poems that, that we had talked about uh, that have to do with um, intimate partner violence and violence against women. Although honestly, since the pandemic, um, things feel different to me. I, I thought I knew what my, what my work in progress was going to be about. And now I think, well, mm, does it need to be something different um, because, because the world has shifted. Uh, so, um, not writing a lot at the moment because teaching um, during the pandemic is hard. And uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe later that will happen. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm sort of uh, feeling through it. And, and anytime an idea occurs to me, I'll, I'll try to get it down. But uh, I got to say, it's mostly grading and working on Canvas and Zoom and fun with technology at this point. Um, have you read anything recently that's inspired you or that you'd like to recommend to us? Uh, yeah, I, I have managed to find time for, for reading. Um, usually, well, before classes started during the pandemic, I was, I was inhaling a, a book a week um, and that's slowed way down since classes started, but I, I do always make, make time for poetry. Um, one of the collections I read recently that I really enjoyed was um, by Keisha Kuypers, um, a book called All Its Charms. Um, I liked, I liked, really enjoyed that one very much. Um, and Denez Smith's book, Homie, um, was also pretty terrific. Um, and I think, yeah, Ada Limon's um, The Carrying was another one that I, I, I really liked a lot. Her, her book, Bright Dead Things, is, is just incredible, but the carrying is the, the most recent, and they're, they're terrific. Well, thank you for those recommendations, Juliana, and thank you for taking the time to speak with us today and to share your poetry with us. It's been a real pleasure. Well, thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it.
I've been speaking with the poet Juliana Gray, professor of English at Alfred University. She'll give a virtual reading as a guest of the University of Oregon's creative writing program on October 14th, 2020. Thanks so much for watching.